Hi, everyone. I'm Sandy Chifulius, and I have the uh, the absolute pleasure of introducing Dr. Soldo um, as she gets started for her presentation today. Um, Dr. Soldo is a professor of school psychology and a licensed psychologist at the University of South Florida. Dr. Soldo's research agenda is just spans so much cool stuff, and we're so excited to have her here today. Um, her interests include uh, positive psychology applied to youth, including children and adolescents' subjective well being, the social emotional functioning of high school students participating in accelerated curricular, such as AP or IB programs and the provision of evidence-based school mental health services in multi-tiered framework. Shannon is everywhere, at least in my field. She's an editor, associate editor, editorial board member of, of many journals uh, that many of us know. Uh, and I've known her for um, close to 20 years maybe now. Um, so I've seen her, her work and think it's such a great beacon. So we are absolutely delighted to have her here today as one of our in-chip lectures as part of our M3 EWB uh, network that's designed to advance the science of emotional well-being. Uh, it's one of uh, six U24 networks funded by NIH. And uh, again, we're very delighted to inship for both allowing us to have the opportunity to provide these lectures as part of their series and most especially delighted to have Dr. Soldo here with us today, who is one of our M3EWB advisory board members. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Soldo because you are here to hear from her, her not me. Well, thank you for that warm welcome, Sandy, and it is my pleasure to be with you all today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about how to monitor and increase middle school students' subjective well-being. And what I have prepared for today is a brief discussion of where I see students' subjective well being, which is how we've been defining emotional well being in my work, fitting into a comprehensive definition of student mental health. And I'll share a bit about how this work has evolved over time to move from how do we measure life satisfaction in, in um, SWB or such a well being, how do what correlates with life satisfaction and positive affect. What are some strategies that might work to increase pos increase positive affect and satisfaction? And that comes from the positive psychology literature for the most part. Um, does can we do this work in schools? And if so, how do we prepare existing school mental health staff to provide these newer supports? So I mentioned that they to start with a discussion of where does subjective well-being fit into this definition of student mental health? So as Sandy mentioned, we've known each other for several decades. And when I was trained to provide psychological services, it mostly involved identifying and treating mental illness. So which students had elevated levels of internalizing and externalizing symptoms of mental health problems. And once you identify students who might have elevated symptoms, we then could triage students to provide treatments to reduce intense mental health problems or early intervention to reduce symptoms. And there's still quite the need to identify and treat mental health problems. The window over my slide, I'm being told, move that to the side then. So we certainly still have quite the need to um, identify and treatment health problems. But when we focus just on illness, what we're assuming really is that um, wellness is the flip side of the absence of problems. And some of our early work looked to see, is illness the opposite of problems? Or instead, are they separable but related constructs? So a dual factor model of mental health proposes that there are two constructs. Illness is certainly always gonna have a place, but wellness might be, you might have children that are um, not doing well in terms of their pathology, so might have high symptoms, emotional and behavioral problems, and their level of happiness is low, but there could be students that have elevated symptoms of emotional and behavioral problems, but when you ask them about their life satisfaction and positive affect, those students are seemingly content with how things are going. I would call them symptomatic but content. And it's also po possible that we have students that are not identified as having elevated emotional and behavioral problems, but when you ask them about their life satisfaction, they're languishing in life, it's relatively low. So when we first started testing out, is illness the opposite 
of wellness or are they separable constructs, we propose that there's actually probably four groups. There could be kids that have high emotional behavioral problems and low wellness. Those are kids I propose are troubled. And um, there probably are kids who have no emotional behavioral problems and high happiness. There are students I would call having a complete mental health profile. So that would be illness mirroring wellness. But potentially there's two additional groups that would be missed if you conceptualized wellness as simply the absence of problems. So the two groups that we wondered if we would see are kids that had low emotional behavioral problems, but were languishing, and kids whose happiness would be discrepant from what you might expect given the level of mental health problems. So when we um, surveyed large groups of elementary, middle, and high school students, what we have seen is all four groups exist. At the cross-sectional level at any given time, about 58 to 60% of students have high wellness and low illness. And high wellness would be positive levels of life satisfaction and positive affect, and low levels of emotional and behavioral problems. And then about 13 to 16% of kids across samples are um, students I would refer to as needing the most mental health supports, troubled, if you will. These kids have high levels of, of internalizing, exercising problems, and low levels of subjective well being. And then at least a quarter of students would be misclassified if we only examined their levels of illness or wellness. And about 14% of kids have a vulnerable mental health profile. They have the absence of um, clinical levels of emotional and behavioral problems. But when you look at their happiness level, is it low? They are not content with their life, or they experience more negative affect than positive affect. But do not have elevated emotional and behavioral problems potentially yet. But when we're looking at them, and then about the same number of kids are symptomatic but content. They would be caught on screeners, emotional and behavioral problems, but their life satisfaction is intent, is, is um, intact. So does this matter? It only matters if kids, does happiness matter? It only matters if kids who have similar levels of emotional and behavioral problems have different levels of outcomes. And what we see is yes, subjective well-being does indeed matter. And in particular, students that have high life satisfaction in combination with low emotional behavioral problems have better outcomes than their peers who also are without illness. We wouldn't catch them on screeners of emotional behavioral problems, but when you ask them about their life satisfaction and happiness, it's low. So those students who, all of these kids, again, not gonna be picked up on screeners of emotional behavioral problems, but low happiness and average to high happiness, students that have high wellness in combination with low illness tend to have better outcomes in terms of their physical health, their social adjustment. Um, at the high school level, report higher levels of self-esteem and self-concept clarity, and they do better academically. The students in our studies who have had the highest level of student engagement and also perform the best on um, end of course exams, earn the best grades in class, done the best on their um, high stakes testing, have the combination of high subjective well-being in combination with low emotional and behavioral problems. And they do better in all of these areas than their peers who are vulnerable, vulnerable in that no illness, but also low wellness. So what that means as a school psychologist is that it's important to conceptualize student mental health on both indicators. How are students doing on the illness side and how are they doing on the wellness side? So when we look at student mental health as conceptualized on both of these things, it becomes really important to assess and monitor internalizing, externalizing problems, but we can't just stop there because the students with the best outcomes have low levels of these um, challenges with mental health, but also the highest levels of life satisfaction and happiness, as well as strong relationships. So in the work I've been doing for the last decade at least, we have looked at student mental health as the combination of their status on uh, measures of emotional behavioral problems and their status on measures of well-being. And in addition to measuring student mental health, this now dictates what we do school-wide to support student mental health. Our school-based mental health services from this very comprehensive model need to both address the risk factors for emotional and behavioral problems and increase the protective and resilience factors that lead to high levels of subjective well-being in relationships. 
So that's where I'm going to talk about today is where the role of positive psychology interventions come into play, because the science of happiness has a lot to um, yield in terms of what are the building blocks of subjective well-being, what are the things that we can target and improve in kids to increase life satisfaction and happiness. In comprehensive school mental health services, um, don't just stop there. These positive ecology activities go hand in hand with our traditional social emotional learning programs that in general tend to build relationship skills and also down regulate negative emotions like anger, frustration, um, anxiety, even positive psychology emotions and the positive psychology interventions in their hand tend to upregulate positive feelings that underlie life satisfaction and happiness. And these types of interventions go hand in hand with our activities to reduce conduct problem and prevent and reduce internalizing problems. So all four of these things matter, um, but today I'm going to talk about this positive psychology side in particular, because that's where our strategies to deliberately evoke positive feelings come from. So where this research started from is um, research on children's life satisfaction that really predated the positive psychology paradigm shift in psychology. So Scott Huebner at South Carolina is one of the first individuals to start developing measures of students' life satisfaction in the 90s. And once those psychologically sound measures of that cognitive aspect of well-being were, were, um, were created, that led for the possibility to understand what correlates with high levels of life satisfaction and positive affect. Knowing what correlates with high life satisfaction and positive affect then allowed people to develop interventions that target those correlates of positive mental health. And only in the last decade have we seen empirical evidence that you can do interventions that, that deliberately target those correlates of happiness and, and get lasting changes in happiness that then impact some of the other outcomes that we know correlate with life satisfaction. So at the correlational level, what we know is that students who report higher levels of life satisfaction and positive affect tend to earn better grades, do better on standardized tests, have more positive affective and cognitive engagement in school, tend to report better physical health and get sick less often and miss fewer days of school. They tend to report better relationships at home and with peer groups. They also tend to experience less peer victimization and develop fewer symptoms of mental illness, things like depression, anxiety. So lots of cross-sectional benefits of um, having a higher level of life satisfaction. So that begs the question of, well, can we do things in schools that evoke um, positive affect in an intent to increase life satisfaction? And if you do, are you going to see experimentally changes in those outcomes that co-occur with um, naturally high life satisfaction? So I'll share in a little bit the research that we've done at the tier two or targeted level, but there's been some very inspiring school-wide research published in the last decade that has answered that question of, can we change children's life satisfaction through deliberate activities in schools with a yes? And in particular, the studies that are cited on this slide um, have applied a positive psychology approach to education at middle school levels and seen that middle schools that have trained teachers in um, strategies to promote gratitude, optimism, positive relationships, um, and identification and use of character strengths Compared to matched schools that are randomly assigned to business as usual, the schools and classrooms at the middle school level that adopted a class-wide positive psychology approach have um, shown in randomized control trials that children in those classrooms do indeed experience significant increases in positive affect, significant reductions in negative affect, and reductions in the illness side of student mental health. And um, really important for doing his work in schools, those gains in well-being have translated to improvements in student engagement and higher grades throughout the course of middle school. So only in the last decade have we seen these randomized controlled trials that have demonstrated that positive psychology practices that are taught in schools 
and in particular two teachers who then incorporate the activities in their classrooms can lead to robust positive effects on mental health student engagement and course grades. So I hope that shares some of the background on why I believe strongly that schools are a terrific setting to bring some of the research on how to improve ha increase happiness to children. So what I just shared was an example of a universal approach to um, increasing student happiness. The work I'm, that I've been doing mostly though over the last 15 years has been um, uniquely situated at the tier two level, identifying students that have room for growth in subjective well-being. Um, we identify those students and then invite them to take part in a multi-component um, program called the Wellbeing Promotion Program, or WBPP for short, that is an early intervention for students that have room for growth and life satisfaction. So this is for, you go back to those four groups of students I introduced earlier, this is a program uniquely for students that in universal screenings report um, low levels of life satisfaction and positive affect. So it sets aside um, if they do or do not have elevated symptoms, emotional and behavioral problems. It uniquely focuses on students whose particular area of need um, is subjective well-being. So there are students that identify as having, who report low levels of either life satisfaction or positive affect. So those four groups of students earlier, this is an intervention for kids who are either vulnerable or troubled. So kids who have low wellness, and low illness or low wellness in combination with high levels of emotional behavioral problems. And the intervention, the Wellbeing Promotion Program, is um, a manualized intervention that's the back half of the, the book that is shown on the screen. So when we went to develop this intervention, um, around the year, I think it was 2007 or 8, we started this, uh, started creating this intervention. We looked at the literature on what determines happiness. What are the targets that we should be addressing? And in 2005, the, um, this model of determinants of happiness was advanced. And this model that was advanced at the time um, proposed that it seems like our best available evidence suggests that about 50% of the variability between people's happiness has a genetic component. It's a pretty, pretty high variability um, explained, a pretty high amount of variance explained by genetics. And at the time, the, the thought was in about 10% of the differences between individuals' levels of life satisfaction and positive affect can be attributed to their life circumstances. The country they live in, the weather that you are in, if you're extremely wealthy or not, these like big ticket items that are pretty hard to change. And about 40% of the variability between um, different differences between people's happiness levels uh, was purported to thought to be attributable to your deliberate ways of thinking, interacting, and striving. These intentional activities that is most of the, the theory of why we have any power at all to potentially change our happiness. So this research that suggested up to 40% of the variability in happiness scores was um, something you could potentially change through your daily thoughts, interactions, and, and striving led to a wealth of research on positive psychology interventions or positive activities, however you want to call it. And over the last 15 years, many different research groups have tested out various activities that try to increase gratitude, kindness, uh, mindfulness-based interventions, identification and use of character strengths to see can you, um, by, by targeting that part of the variability is attributable to how you deliberately behave, can you increase their, your happiness? And what we know now, 15 years later, is that that original theory that spurred a whole lot of investment in looking for what are some of those activities that you could do intentionally to increase happiness, um, it spurred a lot of research into can you create a, ha a lasting gain in happiness. And 15 years later, if you fast forward, what we know is that that original pie chart, if you will, has a lot of value. It spurred good research and um, it was generally on the mark but it didn't capture all of the things that 
contribute to what makes a person have high or low levels of life satisfaction and positive, positive affect. And those proportions that were initially advanced were, were merely suggestions based on what was known now. Then we know now is that genetic component is probably closer to the 40% mark than 50% mark. We also know that there are other major circumstantial issues that matter. Um, and for some people, that 10% of your life circumstances is a much bigger influence because your particular um, setting might be uh, so salient to you that that's going to be a, an overwhelming determinant of your own personal happiness. We also know that on the intentional side that you have to be motivated and bought into doing the activities in the first place in order for them to work. Um, but the kind of the silver lining to all of this research or really the exciting part to me is that there are ways to increase your personal happiness, um, but you have to have a, a program or a way of work, some methods to do so. So what are those methods to do so? So recently, Donaldson did a synthesis of the literature and showed that the strategies that do, um, that do have an evidence base for increasing happiness, they have some commonalities. They first involve deliberate skill development of a given target like gratitude, kindness, hope, optimism, et cetera. And once you have a target and activity, then you need an opportunity to learn it. Um, learn a simple skill that you can incorporate into daily life and keep it up. And once you practice that skill, um, there needs to be an opportunity to reflect on it for you to realize that you did indeed change your level of affect or life satisfaction based on use of that skill. And there has to be some accountability to actually performing it. It's helpful to have somebody to come back and talk to it about whether it's a coach, a parent, um, a therapist, a teacher, having somebody to relate the activity to seems to be one of the things that is a critical ingredient for increasing your happiness through use of a given skill. And you've got to keep it up. Um, the interventions that work allow for you to incorporate that skill into your daily life and have a mechanism for continued use. So the positive activity model addresses those exact um, findings in the research literature and it underscores the intervention that we've been developing over the last um, 15 years now and refining that the way to increase your personal happiness is by trying out many different individual activities. Positive activities are intended to evoke positive feelings, help you frame your past, present, and future in more positive ways. Um, and then satisfy your need for relationships and autonomy for your youth. And it's different strokes for different folks. The activities that some people like and work for them are different across individuals. So it's really important to help create a toolbox, if you will, of different positive activities. And then to mix up the ones that you're using at a given time um, so that you don't habituate to that certain activity. So the intervention I'm going to describe is based on three primary principles. We have developed a, a 10 session positive psychology intervention that's a, a multi-component intervention um, as a parent and a youth component and school-based leaders who lead the groups. Um, and you learn multiple different positive activities, but it's not the only way of increasing happiness. And what our individuals that lead our small groups with our, with our students continually come back to is anything that they're going to do to evoke positive feelings of their past, present, and future is one of the key ingredients for how we improve happiness. So we have a set of eight to 10 activities that we do throughout 10 sessions, but it's not finite. The different activities really could be infinite. So anything you're doing to evoke positive feelings is along the lines of what work. And anything you could do to build a gender relationships is also really critical. And then once you have those skills and are in the habit of relating those skills and sharing them with others and forming bonds, anything that that group leader could do or the counselor could do to harness individuals' motivation to use those skills when it feels right for them. So there are certainly times where negative emotions are present and they're functional and they're appropriate for the, the time and the setting and that person. So it's not like we're saying use these tools all the time, but understand how they work so that when you would like to have some control over your mood and improve your mood to the extent possible, you have the skills and strategies to do so. 
So the well-being promotion program I've alluded to, we started developing around 2007. Our first publication on it came out in 2014. And that first publication, we looked at a small group intervention that had 10 core sessions. It had activities intended to increase positive feelings of the past, present, and future through targeting gratitude, kindness, identification, use of, of uh, character strengths, savoring positive feelings, and then developing a hopeful and optimistic mindset. What we saw in our initial applications is that students who did these activities increased in life satisfaction and compared to students that were in a delayed condition control group, but the gains tended to um, reduce as time went on. So we added a family component to increase generalizability and also um, added monthly follow-up sessions. And that has been a, a good um, pathway towards lasting gains on multiple indicators of subjective well-being. So our current well-being promotion program consists of 10 core sessions where students, depending on their age, learn eight to 10 different um, unique positive activities to deliberately upregulate positive feelings, build instructor relationships, and then build motivation to use these activities in their own life. And we usually do that in the fall semester in our middle school applications. And then throughout the spring semester, we bring the gang back together on a monthly basis and we review the activities they learned in the core program. And then we focus in also on either gratitude, character strengths use, or hope and optimism um, in that monthly session. And that comprises a complete well-being promotion program. So this program, um, again, we've been working on it for about 15 years now, um, it does align nicely with what we now see is the critical active ingredients for increasing um, well-being in any kind of activity. Because in the course session, students learn these discrete positive um, activities, then they're practicing them in session and for take home challenges between hand. The sessions include open discussions about how the activities change that child's mood and enhance the relationships. The students are using some handouts to record their feelings while they're trying out the positive activities between sessions. Um, there is a caregiver component so that the students are encouraged to talk to somebody at home about the activities, but even if they don't want to, they're talking about the activities with their group leader and the other peers in the group. And then those maintenance sessions that are in the spring really help to solidify the learning gains by having students have an additional practice in those different positive activities. So the weekly course sessions, here's kind of a schedule for what we address in each session. We start out with, um, in session one, a rationale for even engaging these activities. And we share with them that science of that happiness pie, that yes, part of your happiness is determined through genetics and kind of what you were born with. Some of it is determined based on your personal circumstances. But fortunately for most people, there is variability in your own happiness that comes back to the activities that you choose to incorporate in your daily life. So then we do our first activity, which is called Me at My Best, where we have them um, hearken back to a time where they were using their strengths and doing well. Then we turn to, in the next week's activities that foster gratitude. In week four, we turn to activities that incorporate um, act actions that allow them to feel better in the moment. So we do acts of kindness and they learn about their own character strengths and plan ways of using their strengths in new ways. And then once they start seeing the positive um, feelings that come from using their strengths, we teach them tools for savoring them. And then the final three sessions move to activities that um, evoke positive feelings about the future. And in particular, they learn a strategy for how to think optimistically, um, do activities that uh, evoke hope. And then in our final session, we review all the tools they learned and celebrate their progress and skill development. And in that very first week, we also meet separately with the caregivers for a half hour informational session. And then they get weekly handouts throughout the um, 10 core sessions that I'll show you in a minute. So it's a manualized intervention. If you pick up the um, Guilford published the Guilford published book, um, you'll see leader protocols that uh, guide each session. It also include handouts for the group leader to use to as like visual aids, and there's materials for the students to use throughout each session. This is just a sample of the materials for session one. There's also a fidelity checklist that the leader can use to monitor their adherence with the manualized content. And then there's a one page flyer that goes home with the parent each week 
that explains what happened this week in group, what was your child assigned for their take home challenge, and how can the parent help at home. So this is an example of one of the positive activities. In week one, we asked the students to think about a time they are at their best, like doing something really well, going above and beyond for someone else, displaying a talent or creating something. And then students write about that time. So it's an independent writing time where they are writing their version of me at my best, okay? So I'm gonna read aloud to you a middle school student's present example of me at my best. And let me say first, all of these positive activities that are embedded in the Wellbeing Impression Program come from what has worked to increase happiness and randomized control trials with adults, usually college students. So what our group did starting in about 2006 and seven is look through the literature of what worked with adults, make it developmentally appropriate for youth, and then package it into a multi-target 10 session program. So here's an example for a sixth grader. She said, usually every day after I get home and eat dinner, I play the piano and cello. Every day I try to do my best to make beautiful music for my parents and for myself. It takes a lot of hard work and concentration, but for me, it has gotten easier since I play almost every day. I try to outdo myself and do better than I did yesterday and achieve my goals. This is me at my very best every day. Well, that was her individual independent writing activity. And after each kid in the group, there's usually about seven or eight kids in a group, after they spend some time writing, then we ask them to introduce themselves, their meet my best story. And we ask the individuals in the group to, to reflect on what strengths they heard from their classmate when they shared that story. So then in session five, we go back to that story and we hand out the VIA classification of character strengths. And after they have received definitions of these character strengths, we ask them to use this vocabulary of strengths to identify the strengths that they saw in their story. So an example that I just shared with you, when I look through this character strengths definitions, I might say, okay, the student who likes the cello and piano um, might have appreciation of beauty and excellence. She's a, in, in all of beautiful things in the world, like um, skilled performances. She also has potentially creativity um, because she thinks of new ways of playing. And she said, it takes a lot of hard work and concentration. So that demonstrates um, perseverance and persistence. So then the next week, session six, we asked them to take the VIA youth survey online. And this is the strengths profile for this student who I just read aloud her, me, my best story. And sure enough, of the 24 strengths, the ones that come most naturally to her are creativity, appreciation of beauty and excellence, love of learning. Remember how she mentioned she likes playing for her family? So that capacity to love and be loved also came through. Other activities that we do in this, um, in this program, I just have screenshotted some of them. In week two, we do a gratitude journal. So here's an example, gratitude journal of a fifth grader. Um, she was grateful for her music teachers. This is her, her entry 16. So just screenshotted one from like well into it. This day she was reflecting on how grateful she was for her music teachers, um, that in fifth grade, everybody looks up to her. Uh, that she gets to go skateboarding and hardly ever gets hurt, um, and that she is particularly grateful for her grandmother. Um, in week eight and nine, we turn to um, actions that engender positive feelings of the future. We do uh, optimistic explanatory style in weeks eight. And in week nine, you do an activity called best possible self in the future. For the middle school students, we usually have them write out and the directions are the same, whether they write it or draw it, we tell them to think about their life in the future, take a few minutes to imagine that everything has gone as well as it possibly could. You have worked hard and succeeded at accomplishing all of your life goals. Write about that future. So we ask them to really in vivid detail describe their best possible self in the future. 
And then to develop pathways to reach them, reach that goal, then we ask them for homework, um, their take home challenge to think about how they can make that happen. For younger kids, we usually do a lot of writing rather than drawing. I'm sorry, drawing rather than writing. So this is a second grader and her best possible self in the future was graduating college with friends. So her picture is her with her diploma and then her two friends with her cap and gown on. And then for her take home challenge of how she would achieve it, what she came up with, future minded little girl Kim with she wanted to earn scholarships, get good grades, make that happen and use her manners to keep her friends. So she had some friends to graduate with. So this activity again helps them visualize what they want to happen, which is really a motivator to do those steps to help their their ideal future come true. So after those core sessions, um, and session 10, we celebrate all the different skills they've learned. And then about a month later, we come back and recap those 10 activities, ask them how they've been using them. And then we do additional activities that hi highlight gratitude. The next month, we come back to identify activities that help them use their character strengths in new ways. The following month, we tend to come back to opposite thinking. And then if we have four months in that semester, we'll land on spotlighting hope and kids make a hope map. So I mentioned that there's a caregiver component in this uh, intervention. So the caregiver component is meant to help generalize the activities that children learn to the home setting. So it's not just that small group at school, but it also provides an opportunity to impact wellness in the family unit. We know there's those correlations between parent and children's happiness levels, um, and it allows an opportunity for the children to um, think about how they're going to like keep it going. So this habit they're developing in the group, if they incorporate it at home, the likelihood of it staying is, is much higher. So our caregiver component is meant to be straddling um, how much it requires the parent. So we know that um, caregiver components and school-based interventions that are too extensive lead to parents withdrawing from them. Um, and we know ones that are too passive, so they're like just receiving information, um, tend to disengage families as well. So our intervention is trying to straddle being present, but not overwhelming for parents and not overly passive. So what it looks like is a one-time initial caregiver information session where they can come and talk to the group leader about why their child is identified, why does happiness uh, matter, uh, what are the activities that we're going to do in the group, and how they can help support. And that one introductory session is the only time we ask parents to come meet us, build trust, and have that caregiver connection. It's a manualized session where um, we follow a, a script for our goals for that 30 minutes. And we make sure we allow time to demonstrate at least one positive activity in that 30 minute session. And then there's a, a two page parent handout that's also included in the manual that defines the key terms that we cover in the program, um, explains why we think parents' happiness is really critical to their kids' well being, and then provides an overview of the 10 session program. Then after that first session, we keep parents surprised by sending home a one page handout. So here's examples of the handout for the week on gratitude journaling and the week on acts of kindness. Um, over the decade of doing this with the parent handouts and parent information sessions, we've learned some lessons. Uh, we've learned that inviting, kit, inviting parents, how that um, information comes out is really important. Um, so we use a multi-pronged strategy now if we send home an email, a text message, and a letter, and then we also ask the children themselves to invite the parents to that first session. So we hold it just after the first session for the children, same week. We meet the kids first and ask them to invite their parents so they can learn more. We offer it at varying times of the day. So like next week, we're starting it at a school, the program at the school, so we're going to have a session at 9 a.m., at 2 p.m., and at 7 p.m. And then people are offered opportunities to come in person to the 9 a.m. one or meet after school um, via Zoom. And then we're doing a hybrid at the 2 p.m. one. And then when we have it on campus, we make sure that we have, when we have it at school, we make sure we have things for younger siblings to engage in. For the weekly activities, those one page handouts, we try to send that home with a hard copy with the kids. We send it via text message with a picture and then also via email to make sure that we're not just depending on the children to hand it to their parents, um, but there's multiple ways to access it. 
So this are some quotes from parents who have whose kids have taken part in the program. We do an accessibility survey at the end of the intervention and um, have been really encouraged by parents' receptivity to the entire intervention. Um, they have really seemed to, when, we, when given a chance to provide open-ended answers to what did you like best about the Wellbeing Promotion Program, um, they say things like, this has been a great opportunity for mental health education for a middle schooler. I'm very glad and grateful that my child could learn more about, could participate and learn more of the topics. I talked to my child about the content and did some of the readings, but regret they were not more involved. So that's a typical parent for us. We get about 15 to 50 percent participation in a parent info session, and then um, they report like being able to access and actually consume about half on average of the 10 weekly handouts. So this parent wish she was more involved, but they have lots going on, right? Um, some parents don't are involved at all, and others are like. Hey, it's Thursday. You send that text out on Wednesday. Are you getting to it? I really want to know what my kid learned. So others like chomping at the bit to generalize those skills at home. So in our remaining minutes, I wanted to spend some time talking about how to identify students for this program and then um, share with you how we're training school psychologists, school counselors, and school social workers in the program, which is where we are now, as opposed to relying on our research staff to come in and provide the program. So we, it's a tier two program. Um, we have done it school wide and class wide, but most of our um, efficacy studies are at the tier two level and we rely on universal screening data to identify uh, the students who would benefit from the program because they have either a vulnerable or troubled mental health status. There's a lot of challenges related to doing screening. There are not challenges that are insurmountable, but they're things to think through in advance. Does my district require me to have active consent for screening or passive? How will I keep my students' data confidential? The measures that we use are available for free in the public domain, but they all require a data management system. So we've had schools use survey monkeys, um, Qualtrics, administer paper and pencil to put into Excel. So there's lots of options to plan ahead for how you're going to collect and manage your data. The use of cut scores is interesting. So there's not a magic number of like, this is so low of life satisfaction that you need the intervention. Instead, we have offered it sometimes to kids who have any room for growth, other times kids who are, their average score is in the negative range. Um, and our identification of cut scores really comes with identifying a, a cut score for, for this for this school will usually identify about 25% of kids, the lowest quartile, if you will, of kids uh, who have low life satisfaction and positive affect. And when we have a higher need than that, we pull back and say, you know what, when we applied those cut scores to your school, like half the students could benefit. So let's see how we could push into all of the classrooms that could be more appropriate for your school. If we are though gonna offer it to a, a, um, a group of kids at the tier two level, then we definitely have to have active parent consent for that small group intervention, um, which is another thing to work through how you will communicate with parents to get that permission in a, a least stigmatizing manner. And then once you have the group of kids you could work with, you wanna think about how you can form and schedule your small groups to be minimally disruptive to their academic learning as well. So there's lots of things to think through. So the measure that we use most commonly in our screenings of life satisfaction is Scott Huebner's brief multidimensional student's life satisfaction scale, which is available for free in the public domain. And it's a quick um, one item indicator of happiness in each core domain of life, as well as a global indicator of life overall. We've also used um, a 10 item version of the PANIS to look at um, positive and negative affect. I just want to give you an example of what that might look like. This is a school that we are working with right now in the Tampa Bay area. Um, we're in several schools this year in this area for a randomized control trial. In this middle school, we had about a thousand kids um, present at the beginning of the school year. We were required to use active parent consent for screening. Um, so we ultimately heard from 63% of parents, 52% said my kid could take part in the um, life satisfaction affect screening, 11% said no, and we never heard back from um, about a third. So we're able to screen the 52% of kids whose parents said yes, they could do the screening. 
And of the 473 students who were there and present during our screening window, um, about 33% were identified as having, in this case, our cut score for low life satisfaction was anybody whose average score was below mostly satisfied. So anybody's average score was in the mixed to dissatisfied range on our um, one to seven metric. So we invited for this uh, tier two intervention, anybody whose average score was below a five. I've had other times that we've made a lower or higher cut score it really has to do with your availability to provide that resource. So of the third of kids who had um, how we operationalized low life satisfaction, then we invited those 150, um, I think we lost three kids left the school in the few weeks before we were identifying. So the 151 kids who were eligible, we received parent permission from two thirds of the students for the kid to take part in intervention. And we randomly assigned half to start in the fall and half to start in the next semester. And then we were left with, um, for instance, 20 kids in sixth grade. So we split it into two groups. And I'll talk in a minute about what we think about when we create our small groups. So the kids in this uh, in this um, example, they filled out this one page screener of life satisfaction, so the B missiles, and then we used a few others for validity checks just to make sure they were reading. So the children that we invited had scores below five on the B missiles, but they also um, were their scores on the a global measure were consistent. They weren't topping out on global happiness despite reporting low levels here. So we used some of these other measures for validity checks, but our primary one was the B missiles. When we form groups, we take like the 20 kids in sixth grade and think that sounds about like two sizable groups. Um, we think about who are the kids who don't have known histories of not getting along. Um, so we usually encourage our input from lots of folks on a, on a school team to share who they'd like to put in a group together um, and think about how can we arrange this group so that it's not impacting kids core academic learning too much. So they in our situations, they miss the same class every six weeks because we rotate through their core their, their classes. To monitor outcomes in this intervention, we often use global and multidimensional levels of life satisfaction and link their measures of positive and negative affect. So how well does this intervention work? We have had um, two randomized controlled trials and we're in the midst of a third. Our first one um, that we did in 2007, we found that that B missiles was a, a feasible way to identify kids that had low life satisfaction. And we had success with groups that were small or large. Um, it didn't seem to affect our effect, our uh, in effect sizes if we held the groups once or twice per week. Um, and we found that in this first trial, that sixth graders who are randomly assigned to the intervention experienced life satisfaction gains compared to peers who were waiting, but the gap seat seemed to decline over time, which led us to then add those booster sessions in the parent component. In this study that included the parent component, caregiver component, and the follow-up sessions, um, we used the B-missiles again to screen students at a given school, randomly assigned to intervention now or later, and we looked at the students' outcomes in terms of life satisfaction, positive negative affect, and emotional and behavioral problems. And what we found in this study was um, at the we matched them. Um, we uh, stratified our sample based on baseline global satisfaction scores. So the kids in the intervention now compared to the control group started the same in terms of global life satisfaction. After the 10 week program, the students who were in the well-being pressure program had significant increases in life satisfaction compared to the kids who waited. And that effect size was still significant two months later, but it was narrowing as you see. Whereas on positive affect, we had significant growth on positive affect and that gap stayed the same throughout our two month follow up period. And then we also found significant reductions in negative affect among students who took part in the program and then non significant trends for reductions in internalizing and externalizing problems. So those studies led to um, led us to uh, apply for and receive support to do an efficacy study um, funded by Institute of Educational Sciences. And in this study, we're seeing how long do these gains in mental health sustain? To what extent do they impact academic outcomes? What does it cost to do this in the schools? And most importantly, how can you train existing school mental health resources to do it? 
So what we are doing with our school mental health resources, our school psychologists, our school counselors, our school social workers, is divide, it, we have um, developed professional development mechanisms for them to learn these activities and learn the program and then provide it with high levels of fidelity. So the school mental health staff that we work with go through a series of six two-hour workshops to learn about positive psychology and have opportunities to actually, in the workshops, practice role-playing the various sessions. And in addition to these six two-hour workshops, they apply the activities to themselves through using what we refer to as a wellness journal. That before each workshop, they learn one of the evidence-based ways of increasing happiness from the adult literature, try it out, um, and then track their mood throughout so they see how use of positive activities and relationship building activities improve their own life satisfaction and positive affect. And after they go through that series of six to our workshops and take quizzes on positive psychology knowledge, knowledge before and after, they're either certified to be a leader of the Wellbeing Question Program in their school, or they have to get some type of additional support to either boost up their knowledge in their didactic knowledge of positive psychology and the intervention or additional practice and best practices and group counseling skills in order to get certified to become a group leader. And then once they become a group leader, they get involved in coaching. And our coaching model is that each leader of the program meets for 30 minutes a week with um, a school psychologist who has expertise in positive, positive psychology. And that coach reviews audio tape sessions and provides a 30 minute meeting feedback on the strengths of that session, the fidelity to the, to the model, to the manual, and the group counseling skills that were illustrated. And our, our kind of framework for those coaching sessions is that we use a lot of motivational interviewing, behavioral skills training, and then strength spotting and principles of positive psychology throughout those coaching sessions. And so far what we've seen is that we've had a lot of interest in our um, school mental health staff taking part in coaching sessions. They talk about what valuable PD that's been for them, that they haven't had that type of intense skill development since they've left graduate school. Um, so we have very few folks who ever cancel those coaching meetings that it's highly valued and that that has led us to having um, well over 80% fidelity to manual uh, cross sessions. Our mode per group is 100%. So it's been really, really effective in getting our group leaders to um, apply what they learned in that PD to the next sessions. So we have some time for some questions. I'll turn it over to Sandy to tell me how much time and to facilitate that. And I will leave this slide up. Thank you so much. We have about five minutes and we can monitor the chat. And I believe Josh also is going to unmute folks so that you can go ahead and unmute or you can unmute yourself. That's what it says to ask your question. I have a bunch, but we'll turn it to the audience first. Hey, Shannon, thank you so much for that presentation. I was curious to hear about in terms of the screening, screening kids into this portion of things. Because I know like we in schools, we've traditionally been focused on psychopathology and screening and sort of the concerns that families may have over the appropriateness of, of screening for that in the schools. And I'm curious, you know, anecdotally what the reactions from families have been in terms of their willingness to, to participate in that process and seeing this as like something that should be happening in school setting. Yeah, so we, our parent notification letter explains that we're doing a well-being screening, that we are um, checking in on students' frequency of positive and negative moods and asking about their happiness of various portions of life. And we talk about that we're screening for well-being because well-being is tied to students' academic um, and social success. So it's definitely, it is a well-being screening, right? It's subjective well-being. We just leave it with well-being. Um, across schools, I would say we have had about eight to 10 parent, eight to 10% of parents opt out 
So say, no, I don't want a child to take part for whatever privacy concern they have. Typically it's privacy concern. Um, and we make it really easy to opt out. They just uh, check no and send the letter back. They don't have to call or anything. They just send back a form. And we send it home in multiple methods. So they could text back a no, uh, uh, email back a no, write back a no. So there's, we do our due diligence with allowing parents to opt out. And across schools, we usually get eight to 10 percent of opt out. So what that means, if you flip it around, is that about 90% of parents um, haven't ha had any kind of concerns. And when we've actually required parent consent for opting in, like active consent, we've had about two thirds of parents like go all the way to say like, yes, I'd like what I'd be uh, screened. Thank you for doing this. So I don't know the, the answer, Amy, of like if those numbers are different than a pathology-based screening, my suspicion would be that there's probably less concern with it because it's wellness focused. And we are very clear that we're not screening for depression. This is life satisfaction and happiness, which is related to but separable. So I, I would imagine there's more, there might be more parent receptivity to that kind of screening. Um, but there's always going to be some parents that are, um, for privacy reasons, don't want anything monitored. And that's their choice, so we ask. Shannon, we have a question in the chat about tier one, and that actually was one of my questions as well, because this this work, you've obviously been funded for this kind of tier two or kids who already have have some type of indication. But what what's out there or what or have you done extensions into the tier two space? Tier yeah. one, sorry, universal yeah. space. Yeah. So um the tier so tier one, uh, I showed earlier those slides on um, the work that's been over done overseas that has really most tier one work has focused on increasing teachers fluency with activities that incorporate um, character strengths, identification and use, building positive relationships, activities that cultivate gratitude, kindness, hope and optimism. And for the most part, they focused on teacher skill development to then translate it into the classroom learning. And there's been really um, encouraging findings, I feel, from those activities that build teachers' skills and emotional fluency and how to evoke positive emotions. Um, and my own research group has definitely taken our 10-week program and worked with teachers to use it class-wide, which has been great with not having to deal with issues of parent consent and being able to serve all the kids that you want to. The reason that we created this one as a tier two support is because of that gap that exists with kids that have this vulnerable mental health status um, and they're not getting social emotional instruction for whatever reason that is meeting their needs um, and they need additional skill development in tools that evoke positive feelings. So we've been testing it out mostly because of that gap in the tier two um, skill development area for developing skills for evoking positive feelings and relationships. But uh, obviously, in an ideal world, you would have both the universal level present and the tier two work. We have a whole different line of research where we have tested out really promising ways of um, improving teachers' happiness and then seeing that translating to fewer kids in their classes who need the tier two support. That's cool. That's a whole other topic. We'll have to have you yeah. back for sure. <laughs> So we are at 1.30 right now. If there's one more quick question, we can take it. Otherwise, um, we will have you back to teach us all about the, the, the work with teachers and intergenerational kind of effects of what's going on. Um, and I don't see any other questions popping up. So I think we can close it out with our sincere thanks and our gratitude for you uh, being willing to share your time with us today. It's my pleasure. <laughs>